Hallelujah. Around East Tennessee, they say, Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Yes, sir. Jehovah be praised. If you have your Bible, turn to Genesis 8 with me this, morning, uh, this evening, please. You can always tell a real preacher he gets his morning and his evenings mixed up. <laughs> Genesis 8, verse 11. Genesis chapter number 8 and verse 11. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew the waters were abated from off the earth. And Father, I pray now that you anoint your word as it goes out. And Father, I pray you'd anoint the messenger. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you tonight about some of the strange places that uh, messages come from. For example, this dove is doing some preaching over here in the book of Genesis 8. Three times he sends the dove out. First time he sends it out, it comes back, nothing. Second time he sends it out, it comes back with an olive branch. Third time he sends it out, it doesn't come back. First time he sends it out, he sends a raven with it. The raven is a, is a, is a predator, a bird of prey, and it'll eat carrion. And it went to and fro, the Bible said. So apparently the raven went out and found dead body here, something here, something here, and went from one place to the next, but never came back. The dove came back first time. Second time, the dove came back. Olive branch, third time, didn't come back. First time the dove came back, Noah reached out and pulled it into the ark. It doesn't say he did that the second time, but the first time he gently brought the dove into the ark. And the second time, it came with an olive branch. Third time. Notice there's three comings and goings of this dove. That's quite remarkable because in the book of Matthew, chapter number uh, uh, four, a dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So God the Father sends out the Holy Spirit the first time. Holy Spirit goes out, all right? Can't find anywhere. So he reaches out and pulls him back in. Second time, he comes in with an olive branch saying, the one is there now, the Prince of Peace. He's there. Third time he goes out, he doesn't come back because he found one that he could give the full measure of the Holy Spirit to was the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's quite a message there, quite a message. It leads off the start telling you that a raven is not a clean bird, it's an unclean bird. So someone would say, you see, God will never use an unclean thing. Uh-huh. Stick with me. Over here in the book of Numbers chapter 22 and verse 28, the Bible said, The Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And then Balaam said to the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would therefore, I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. The ass said to Balaam, Am not I thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine own to this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? Did I ever try to kill thee? He said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he could see what the donkey couldn't, could see. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. He learned his lesson, learned it quickly. Here is a simple beast of burden speaking. That should have been enough for Balaam. Now he talks back to it. That's enough for anybody. <laughs> Here we are. Here's a man talking to a donkey, donkey talking back to him. What kind of a shape are we in here now? It's a good thing his neighbors didn't come by and see him talking, right? They'd have brought him up before the magistrate. God's about to teach him a lesson. You see, this lesson is that God can rebuke you in ways that just don't make sense. They just don't make sense. And it's just so strange that there's no, uh, there's no explaining it. You just can't explain it. The Bible said God's ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts. It boils down to this simple truth. 
Either he is the Lord God sovereign of my life or he's not. It's that simple. Either he's the Lord or he's not. And everybody wants a Savior. Some people pull their money out, that's their Savior. Some people go to the lodge, that's their Savior. Some people show you their degree over here from UT, that's their Savior. Some people point to their mind, that's their Savior. They'll point to the government, that's their Savior. Everybody wants a Savior. But very few want a Lord. And he said, why call ye thou me Lord, Lord, and do not the things? He, God's reducing Balaam to a point to where he's lower than the donkey. Because the donkey could see what he couldn't see. Don't you think that's remarkable? In other words, God allowed the donkey to look into the spirit world and see something that was surely there. Just like the case of Elisha. Do you remember the story of Elisha? Over there in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 17. The enemy had come in like a flood. They'd come to the gates of the city. Elisha's servant was scared to death. What are we going to do now? He said to Elisha, now what are we going to do? And Elisha said this in 2 Kings chapter 6. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Don't you think that's quite a thing? He opened his eyes. He was rebuked. Certainly he was rebuked. But there's more to the rebuke than that. You see, when we have spiritual instructors and spiritual understanding and live in a spiritual world, and we do, if you half try to live a Christian life, you're going to be walking in the spirit. You're going to be walking with spirits. You're going to be dealing with spirits every day of your life. You got all these occult people out here who think they're in such control of all of this garbage that they're doing, and they're making league with demons. Not so with a Christian. Not so with us. Not so with us. Be not drunk with wine, where is an excess? But be filled with a Holy Ghost, full of the Holy Spirit of God, full of God. But the only way you can be full of God is by the Spirit. So you don't always have to see what you know is there. You see, Elisha knew that the Lord was there in full array. He was there in, 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 in an army to fight the enemy of God. He knew it. But the young man hadn't grown to that point yet. The Bible says the angel of the Lord encampeth about them that fear him. I don't have to see that angel to know he's there. I know he's there. I know he's with me. Sometimes he'll let me see him, though. And that's when they kicked me out of the Baptist Association. I got an email the other day. This lady, this lady in the email, she took me seriously. She thought I really meant it. I don't belong to their association. Don't want to. Never will belong to it. Don't care. Couldn't care less. Sleep good at night. Forget it. But anyway, she said, well, preacher, it's okay. It's all right if they've kicked you out. It'll be all right. <laughs> and she's a good friend. She meant well. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Some of these guys, you know, it's like the one I told you. He said to his master in, the, in, that, in that movement, he said, Now, brother, so-and-so, what do we believe about this? <laughs> Don't ever get there. Don't ever get there. Don't ever get to where you're scared to death to preach or teach something because you're afraid that your religious Hamans are going to do you in and kick you out of the association and blackball you. That'd be awful, wouldn't it? That'd be horrible. My goodness. You talk about, probably the world's got enough trouble without that. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 6, though, here's the raven again. Now, remember, the raven's an unclean bird. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 6. Now we're dealing with Elijah, all right? Elijah. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. Now, that's an unclean bird. And here's a man under the law. Elisha was a man observing the law of Moses. You remember what God, when, 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 when uh, God said, to, when he said to uh, Peter, I want you to rise up, slay and eat Peter, not so Lord. You know, this sheet had come down with all of this unclean stuff on it. And Peter said, not so now, Lord, we are, you, you got the wrong man. You see, it was very important. Their diet was important. This was do or die. He that liveth by the law will die by the law, Paul said in the book of Romans. This is their faith. Their faith is to live the law. It's not that it ever saved them, but it was a manifestation of their faith. 
because it was written in stone. God said to the children of Israel, I'll bring you to a point one day where the law is not written in stone. I'll bring you to a place in your maturity and your growth and your understanding of me. God said to the children of Israel, where the law is written in your heart and not in stone. Amen. They haven't come there yet, but they're headed there. And they will come to that point. So the ravens brought the message to Elijah. They're going to feed him. Now, you could either receive it at their hands or, you know, forget it. Starve to death. I remember the story of an old pastor one time. I think he was raising money for some kind of a project they were doing. And uh, it's a good project. It's, good. it's a good thing. And one of the local bootleggers or a local shop somebody that wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't really, he <laughs> wasn't a Christian. But he wanted to give. So he brought an offering and gave it to the preacher. Well, one of the deacons saw it. And the deacon said to the preacher, now you're going to receive money from a guy like that? The preacher looked over and said, the devil's had it long enough, I'm going to use it now. <laughs> and he used it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Do you remember when the children of Israel left Egypt? Do you remember when they left Egypt? How many of you know your Bible that well? Where'd they get their money from? They got it from the Egyptians. They sure did. They got it from the Egyptians. They sure did. If somebody wants to walk into this house and, and put an offering in here to God and say, I want you to have this, Lord, are you going to reject it? If you reject it, you're rejecting them. Give them an opportunity to make an approach to God. That might be the only way they think they can come to God. But once they do come to him and the grace of God begins to work in their heart, they begin to understand you can't bring anything to come to God except yourself. He's not interested in your money. But how many of you, when you got saved, were expert in theology? Raise your hand. <laughs> how many of you knew everything there was to know about approaching to God and, you know, fellowship with the Lord and communion and all these great doctrinal truths we love and we preach and we appreciate? How many of you knew anything about that? I didn't know squat about squat. I just knew I was lost and I knew I needed to be saved and I called on the Lord and he saved me. And after that, you're very vulnerable as a young Christian. I wish sometimes I could help some young Christians because sometimes they have such a freedom from the, from the burden of sin that they've carried that they go to the extreme in the opposite direction and they're ready to judge and condemn anybody and everybody they see and they become very legalistic. And I got on that course and you can get on that course. They become very legalistic and it makes them feel good in the flesh to be able to condemn somebody. That makes them feel good in the flesh. But once you ever start growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord, it should never make you feel good to see somebody condemned. And it should never make you feel good to see some poor soul fall upon hard times. If you're secure in your own faith, you don't need to be propped up by what's happened to somebody else. When you begin to grow in grace and knowledge in the Lord, you'll find a wellspring of mercy and compassion and love welling up inside you where you might say to yourself, you know, I was there one time and I could be there again, but by the grace of God, ab absolutely, absolutely. Circumstances could happen to us and we could be sleeping under a bridge in six months. That's right. It can happen to anybody. Here over the book of Luke chapter 16, verse 21. Here's quite a message here. Luke 16, 21. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, the rich man and the beggar. We've got a rich man and we've got a beggar. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Boy, a dog. Now, folks, you know I've said this so many times before. You've got a good dog for a pet, good for you. Dogs make good pets. They're smart. It's amazing. Dogs are some of the smartest animals on earth. They can understand French, Japanese, Chinese, English, <laughs> Portuguese. <laughs> well, they've got to be able to understand something. I mean, their owner, their, their master speaks to them. They are all over the world. Hebrew, Greek, you know. Anyway, in the Bible, a dog is not a good thing. They're scavengers, and they represent that which is unclean. They represent that which is, uh, you know, to be detestable. It's detestable. 
But here is an unclean, detestable creature that is licking the wounds of a man that a rich man wouldn't do anything to help. His comfort and compassion came from a totally unexpected place. Think? Right. From the least of places where you would never expect it to come from. I read stories all over the world where people are rejected by the religious community, but some poor old dog out here that doesn't even know Christ will show more compassion and mercy to them than the church. Let me read anything about life. Isn't that a shame? But it happens. It happens. And so can God do something? Else? God can do anything. He can do anything. He can do anything but lie. He can do anything but fail. But God is love. Love is not God, but God is love. Yes, sir. So the dogs licked his sores. The dogs showed him more compassion than the rich man. And the rich man was very religious. Have you noticed? Have you read that, have you read that in Luke 16 when the rich man died? He knew who Abraham was, Father Abraham. He was a Jew. He knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob intellectually, but he didn't know him in his heart. His money got between him and the Lord. So sad. Did you know that my experience is this, and you may find this odd tonight. In the few short years I've been in this world, most people can't handle a pile of money. How many of you agree with that? They can't handle it. They can't. They need to go out and sweat and work and make ends meet and live from week to week or month to month or year to year, however God blesses them and trust the Lord and turn to him for their daily bread. Give us our daily bread. Most people can't handle a pile of money. If you want to read some of the saddest stories in the world, read the stories of the people who've won the lottery. Really? It's sad. And that's not always the case. Like I say, some people can handle money. Abraham was a rich man. Job was a rich man. Rich, very rich. And uh, so the Bible doesn't, in, in per se, condemn all rich people. But the problem is, they that would be rich fall into what? Divers snares. So if you think that winning the lottery is going to be the answer to all of your problems and having a pile of money, you're sadly mistaken. It will not be. Change your character. The only thing that can change your character is God Almighty through His Word and the power of the Holy Ghost. A man that just a man that works with his hands and makes a, and makes a meager living, but lives from week to week, can be far happier than the man who's got millions and billions laid up. Amen. <laughs> Say, well, preacher, I don't know. I like to try it the other way and see how it works with me. <laughs> I know people. I know. I know how they are. Look at Luke chapter 22, verse 16. Now, you never think about this, but here's a uh, rooster preaching. Boy, this thing can flat preach a message. <laughs> I mean, it's doing some preaching. Luke chapter 22, verse 16. Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew, while Peter was still talking. Oh, boy. Now watch this. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Boy, you talk about an awkward moment. Man, I would not want to be in Peter's shoes. Oh, those, those pier that piercing gaze. Oh, boy. Woo, man. And old Pete's memory was jogged real good. And he remembered that he said, Lord, I'll lay my life down. Oh, yeah, the Lord said, sure you will. Sure you will. I know you mean that. I know you mean well. I understand that. This, you're not, you're not play acting. No, but you are not ready. You think you are, but you're not. That's what he was saying to him. He didn't call him a hypocrite. He called the Pharisees hypocrites. Thou hypocrite. He said, you stand on the street corner and you pray. You're hypocrites. You put on an act. Hupokratos is the Greek word. It literally means to act. That's what it means. Have you ever seen the smiling face and the frowning face? You ever seen that together? They used to show it all the time. When I was in Turkey, we were at a place over there called Pamluki. Pamluki, it's a whole, it's, it's kind of like the, the 
the bank, the, the uh, uh, what's that, uh, white chocolate, Dover. The cliffs of Dover over there in England, the other side of the English Channel, the cliffs of Dover. Well, this is similar to that. It's, it's, un, it's, a, it's a world heritage site. There's nowhere else on the earth like it. This, all this white that's coming down and working its way down. But anyway, right before we got there, I'll never forget this, some ruins, here are these ruins dating back to the Greek period. And you know how the Greeks were about performances on the stage. Well, there it is. I saw it right in stone. There's a smiling face and a frowning face. What's it saying? It's saying they, the actor could smile and the actor could frown. But in either case, they were acting. There's an awful lot of acting that goes on. That's the truth. That's the truth. What do they call that thing they give out out there in, Washington, out in, in Hollywood that they'll, that they'll beat each other to death over? Oscar. An Oscar, you know, best actor, best actress, best supporting actor, best supporting actress, best film, best music line, all the rest of that. I'm going to tell you the truth, folks. <laughs> I've seen some mighty good acting in religion in the 40 years I've been around here. <laughs> and I think uh, should be an Oscar should be uh, should be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> how many of you have ever pulled up out there in the parking lot a dog fight at each other, at, at each other's throat, husband and wife going at it, and the minute you walk through the wife, it's good to be here. Hallelujah. <laughs> 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 you look good to be here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is that? <laughs> I, got some, I got some faces in here tonight like this. <laughs> <laughs> He gets faces like this. Most of you are like this, but some of you are like this. <laughs> I didn't mean you. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Acting. We all act a little bit. You ever answered the phone? <laughs> you know, who's calling me? At the well, how you doing? You know? Oh, yeah. Everybody acts a little bit. Y'all, y'all don't do that, right? I'm glad I'm the only one in here. <laughs> Luke chapter number 22. The rooster knew when to knew when to crow, didn't it? The rooster knew when to crow, and boy, did it ever get Peter's attention. Man, you know what it got from him, though? It got the desired result. Notice what it says. Peter went out, and he wept bitterly. All right, that's the best thing ever happened for him. It is. That's the best thing ever happened for Peter. It is. Because he came to grips with what he was all about. Right? It is. It's good. It's, the, it's, good, to, it's good for us. For, the, for God to bring us down to a point where we admit to God. Now, Lord, you know, I mean, I know how to say big, long, sounded, beautiful. Listen, you can pray some beautiful prayers. You've been in this long enough. You can learn some beautiful prayers. Oh, they're beautiful. But then every once in a while you get in there and you'll shut the door and you'll get down on your face and you won't have anything to say. You don't know what to say. That's when you get a hold of God. That's when you get a hold of him. That's when you get a hold of him. It's when Peter was weeping bitterly that God was preparing him to write First and Second Peter. It's when he was weeping bitterly that Peter was being matured and growing in the faith. But he needed that next moment. He needed the next one. That was just as important Peter had been brought down. Peter had been broken. Peter brought to a place of repentance. He was brought to a place to where, all right, Lord, I, you were right. You've been right. You're always right. I admit it. You know, I try to bargain, try to deal, try this, try that. But you're right, Lord. But then when the Lord rose from the dead, he said to his disciples, go tell the disciples and Peter, make sure you put Peter in there. Now that's Mark. Mark wrote that, and uh, I remember reading a long time ago, and I've mentioned it to you in here before, maybe you've forgotten it, but tradition has it, tradition has it, that when Mark wrote his gospel, that Peter was standing right there by his side when he wrote it, and when he got to that part, Peter said, now make sure you put that in there, make sure you put that in there, where he said, and Peter, you know, the Bible is inspired. Every word of God, it's all inspired. Theos God breathed. 
But I do believe that Peter was reduced to that point of absolute submission. But then it took that encouragement. It took that encouragement from the Lord to bring Peter where he needed to be. Remember what Paul said to the church over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? He said, to take such an one and turn him over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh. You remember the man had his father's wife? That's pretty bad stuff. Well, did you know that in 2 Corinthians, the apostle Paul addressed the same man and he said, now don't be overly, be careful with him. You don't want to destroy him. He's already been through enough. Because you've already let him know now from reception of the first letter, you've let him know that he's messed up big time. And God's not going to tolerate that. So now, now go to him and encourage him and help him and help him get back to where he needs to be in his service to the Lord. And that goes exactly with what Paul said in Galatians 6 where he said, Ye that are spiritual, restore, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself also. Amen. You get, a, you get a mature church, folks, you're going to get stuff in here you don't agree with. You're going to see stuff come in here you don't like. You're going to have people come in here you know good and well that they're probably, uh, you know, they're full of hell itself. But you don't have to condone it. But show them Christian love and be the first one there to try to help them come to the Lord. And if one of your brothers, one of your brothers, one of your, one of your own, and you've seen it happen here. One of your own wavers and falls. Don't kick them down. Don't stomp them on down. Don't try to hide behind them. Don't, you know, don't try to pull yourself up by pushing them down. You're weak. If you do that, you're weak. You are weaker. You, listen, you're in for a fall like you wouldn't believe. Because something will come into your life that will jerk the, the rug out from under you and you'll come tumbling down fast. Anybody that goes around trying to hide behind people, stomping people down, and you know, and, and, and justifying yourself and making yourself feel better because, well, I didn't do what old so-and-so did. I'm not as low down as old so-and-so. You'll find out how low down you are because you're not, your faith is not in Christ who reached down and got you. You remember the woman? You remember the one who came and, uh, and, and said to him, now, Lord, how many times should I, should I forgive? He said, 70 and times seven, Right? Yes, continue to forgive. Forgiveness is a wonderful thing. Forgiveness uh, comes up from a wellspring of grace. Well, Acts chapter number 12 and verse 23. The worms are preaching here. Good night. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Boy, man. Have you ever planted a flower dug into the ground and when you dug into the ground, here's this worm down in here, three or four inches. This worm down here in the dirt. What kind of a life is that? <laughs> Good night. It lives down in the dirt, just buried in the dirt. That's, that's quite a thing, quite a thing. You see, the worm was used here to illustrate how fleeting and fickle human Glory is. This was a king. And God brought him down to where the worm was alive and he was dead. Reminding men that we're just men. How art the mighty fallen, it says in the Old Testament. Isaiah 14, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou brought down to the ground which just weakened the nations? How quickly we can come down. So sad. So sad. I don't see anybody fall. I don't. The worms covered him. Now, of course, you know what's going on here. God accelerated the decomposition of his body. That's what he did. That's what happened. These were the maggots from blowflies that literally consumed his body while they stood there and watched him. What does that tell you? That tells you that God can speed up or slow down time. Can God do that? Of course he can. Did he have the sun stand still while they were fighting the battle? Sure he did. God can speed up or slow down time. That's something to think long and hard about when you come back to the creation of this world. And how long it's been here. There's only one that knows how old this earth is. 
Now, I hate to make some of these all know it's out here mad. <laughs> they got it all figured out. There's only one that knows how old this thing is. That's the one who made it. Amen. That's the only one. That's the only one. So finally, the angel is preaching. Revelation 10, verse 5. The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth. Isn't that something? He's standing on water and he's standing on land. Lift up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. Boy, God's got angels preaching in the book of Revelation. The angels become very important in the end time. They're showing up everywhere. And we live in a generation of people today that are worshiping angels. Making a big deal about the angel. Here's the thing about angels, folks. Be careful about them. You've got good angels and bad angels. You've got holy angels and fallen angels. You've got to be careful with angels. Be mighty careful with them. And uh, well, so what do you mean by that? Worship God. <laughs> You don't worship angels. You don't worship men. You don't. Wor you sure don't worship idols. You don't worship. You worship God. <sighs> Nowhere in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, does God ever allow anything to worship anything other than Himself. And the only one who ever walked the face of this earth, a man that men fell before and worshipped, was the Lord Jesus Christ, and rightfully so, because He's God. He's God. So uh, leave the rest of them alone. Be, leave them alone. Be awful careful. An angel is preaching. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians 1, Though I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, let him be anathema. Now that's a strong, that's one of those strong Greek words. What's that mean? It means cursed of God. You can't, nobody can lift that curse. <laughs> If God has cursed you, you're finished. Let him be anathema. Let him be cursed. Let him be accursed. So it's important to preach the gospel, isn't it? That's why I tell you, I, I say it over and over and belabor the point. I'm the messenger bringing the message, but I am not God. I'm just the messenger. That's all I am. And that's my, my place. If I cease to preach the truth of the gospel of Christ, I become illegitimate. You see, I have no intrinsic value. There's nothing to me if I'm not the messenger God sent me to be. There's nothing of value about me if I cease to preach the truth of the word of God. That's the way it is with anything. If an angel that flies through heaven preaches the gospel, revelation, the everlasting gospel, then it becomes a messenger, but it's still the same. It's a creature. There is no intrinsic value in that thing to be worshipped. Only God can be worshipped. And the only way that you can really know that you're worshipping God is by the power of the Holy Ghost. And he witnesses it to the scripture. The power of the Holy Spirit witnessed to the scripture. So we're tied to the book. We're bound to the book. We are people of the book. That's what they call us. That's what they've always called us. The book. The Holy Bible. I'm getting all these emails from people out here that know nothing about, they really don't know anything about manuscript evidence. And in a sense, that's good. You say, what do you mean manuscript evidence? Where did all this come from? You know, we talk about the Alexandrian text of North Africa. We talk about all of the 5,000 plus... Uh, I'm not five, thousands of places where the texts themselves disagree. In other words, the New American Standard Version, the NIV, the RV, the RSV, all these different translations, they don't agree with themselves. They're all over the place. And the reason they don't is because of the text they're taken from. All right, that's just a simple overview of what manuscript evidence is about. But the King James Bible, it comes from a completely different set of manuscripts. Okay, but they don't know that. And that's just as well. They say, preacher, there's something about that book. <laughs> I'd love to hear that. They say, there's something about that book, that KJV. It just gets a hold of me. It talks to me. 
I said, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> I'd love to hear that. I'd love to hear that. Because there's power in that book. Amen. <laughs> yes, sir. Have you ever noticed them when they start comparing translations and, and, they, and they try to say their translation is better than so-and-so? They never say that their translation is better than the NIV. They always say their translation is better than the KJV. Now, what, that's a tacit admission that the KJV is the standard that it's all judged by. <laughs> that's what it means. That's what it means. That's what it means. All right, if you don't believe me, get your NIV, lay it down one hand, the KJV in the other hand, go in your closet, shut the door, put your hand on the NIV, put your hand, or whichever one you got, it didn't make any difference, 50,000 of them. Put your hand on that one, put your hand on the KJV, and say, Lord God, all jokes aside, I want you to show me which one of these books right here is your word that I can pick up and pull next to my heart and look you in the eye and say, Lord, I believe every last word of it. And I don't doubt it for a second. I've got God's infallible word in my hand. Ask him. I'm not interested in what your Greek teacher taught you. Ask him. Ask him. Ask him. See what he tells you. I'd be interested to know. I've done that. I didn't start out with the KJV. I started out with good news for modern man, everything under the sun. They told me back then I was as green as a Christian could be. Green didn't know anything. They said, this is easier to understand. That was the selling point. So I got them, started buying them, reading them. And I got all so messed up. It didn't do anything for me spiritually until I got back to the KJV. I got on my knees and laid my hand on it. And I said, Lord, my faith is in the Word. Do I, can I believe your Word? Is this book your Word? Show me. And with an honest heart and an honest soul, I cried out to God, show me your Word. And this is what he gave me. Right here. The King James Bible. Now you, you won't hear me correct it. I'll use Greek and Hebrew as much as the next man, but you'll never hear me correct the Bible. I won't do it. I'm not going to correct it. I'm just the messenger. What am I supposed to do correcting the Bible? I'm the messenger. If they preached the book, we'd be a lot better off, wouldn't we? Amen. You don't talk about how great your sword is. You pull it out, and there it is. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you don't. You don't talk about a weapon. You use it. <laughs> the business end of that weapon will show you if there's any power in it. <laughs> Father, I pray that you bless your word tonight. I pray, I pray you bless it to the hearing of the people. I pray I've helped somebody, Lord. Set some, something tonight, Father, that's instructive and helpful. In thy holy name, Lord, in thy holy name, in thy holy, righteous name, I pray. Amen.